Welcome to Terrible Lizards, a podcast about dinosaurs with Dr. David Home and Izzy Lawrence. Welcome to episode eight. It's the questions episode. Yay! And it's very special. Is it? Yeah, well, we'll... <laughs> we're I'll ruin in... it early. <laughs> exactly. We are in the same room. Mm. giving each other covid that's well, well we both, i've already had it <laughs> yeah. i've already had it too and we've been double vaccinated so we're and we're in a ventilated place yes so don't worry about us doing... oh yeah so it is the questions episode it is it is which means we have lots of questions thank you very much for emailing um messaging exactly everything to us shall we shall we start well that seems appropriate okay <laughs> cool so this question comes in all the way from germany mm. and it comes from chris do you think we miss a lot of dinosaur species because their skeletons just don't differ enough? Would we, for example, be able to tell a kite from a buzzard in the fossil record? Or even a red kite from a black one? Yeah, very good question. And unfortunately, as usual, the answer is going to be fairly long and complicated and mostly finishes we probably don't know. Um, <laughs> so we've talked about taxonomy a fair bit at various times and you know the act of naming species and telling them apart and issues like can you tell juveniles from adults and stuff like this. Um, but ultimately taxonomy is a process which is trying to put down discrete barriers on something that is a continuum. Evolution is happening constantly you know, the example I always give my students is, you know, there are basically no humans alive today who were alive a century ago and there were none alive a century ago who were alive a century before that. We all call them part of the same species, but there is a real continuum of populations. And if we had, you know, a you know magic perfect time machine camera thing and we could video the history of life on Earth, you know, you would see absolutely every single individual of a lineage across hundreds of thousands or tens of millions of years. And that's a continuum, and you could in theory follow that back through every different lineage down to the very origin of time. That would be worse than useless to be able to try to work with. And so what we're trying to do, as I say, is draw lines across that continuum, and those lines are species, basically. Um, there is a debate even within science about ask do species even exist you know yeah. because they are something of a human construct ironically it's a little easier in paleontology than among living things particularly with something like dinosaurs where so often we're working only from a single specimen or a handful of test specimens from a single fossil locality that they are more discrete in that sense we don't have any of that continuum any of those gaps we don't have weird things like hybridization going on or species starting to separate and then merging back together again and all this complicated nonsense uh, that living species do constantly and make it so much fun. But also, because it's somewhat arbitrary, different groups of taxonomists handle things differently. First of all, you kind of have to, because obviously things like bacteria and sponges and lichen are fundamentally different in so many ways biologically from lizards and beetles and hominids for that matter, but, you know, there's a reason in paleontology why almost everything is just a genus. Mm. You know, it's Tyrannosaurus rex. Well, there's no other species of that. Um, there's two for Triceratops, there's three for Diplodocus. Most things don't, like, just have one, which is why yeah. we just know them by the... But we, we see as Diplodocus, you know, we see we see that as part of the sauropods, so we kind of think of it as a species for those of us who aren't Oh, yeah, but they, they, the weird thing is we usually talk about dinosaur species while only saying genus names, but mm -hmm. that's because they're often truly synonymous, whereas, you know, there's things like Varanus, so the lizard genus, which includes the monitor lizards and things like Komodo dragon, and there's like a couple of hundred species in it or something. And that's so wildly different for dinosaurs where the record is something like 10. <laughs> and there's, you know, and some there are beetle genera with a thousand species in them. Well, yeah, but there's thousands and millions and squillions of beetles. What are close dinosaur species that are next to each other? And what differentiates them? So you've got two Diplodocus. What's the difference between them? So so ultimately it comes down to the, the same general point, actually, in terms of differentiating genera in that it's, are they different enough for taxonomists to think it's worthwhile to split them up? And that, that's pretty much what it ultimately is. Because you did this with a fraction of a skull with a, tri a tyrannosaur. Tyr tyrannosaur, yeah, so Juchang Tyrannus. We've got some other bits, but it's impossible to truly say that they definitely belong with the bits of skull. We've got a maxilla, so 
big major plate of the side of the skull with all of the big teeth in and the maxilla, so the big part of the lower jaw with the teeth in. Um, you and said yet, the maxilla twice then. Did I? Yeah. Oh, sorry. <laughs> dentary. Sorry. Yeah. The big little part of the lower jaw with all the teeth in. But in tyrannosaurs, because this is something we've looked at very heavily, the maxilla has an awful lot of unusual anatomical characteristics, which as far as we can tell are consistent within species, i.e. they're not highly variable, like say hair colour is in humans, or height is in humans. Um, so they're consistent within species, and they differ between species. And so when we see a new combination pattern of these in Juchang Tyrannus, that is an indication that that's not some weird form of variation, or it's just an, it, it, it's a quirky version of a well-known taxa, but it's genuinely something new. I think we also get quite confused as you know, non-zoologists when you're looking at something which has been selectively bred, like a dog, and they're all the same species, but, yeah, but their skulls and everything else... Wildly different, yeah. yeah. And that's that artificial can't happen in selection. nature. Well, in theory, it can. I mean, all, ultimately, all the diversity of mammals has come from one small ancestral lineage, and given enough time and given the right selective pressures, it has produced whales and kangaroos and aardvarks and zebra i love the way i love the ones you go to i like your go-to animals because mine would be blackbirds and squirrels well, not for mammals, and hedgehogs it be, <laughs> oh, yeah, <laughs> a really bad right. job but it's I'm, I'm trying to think of things that are, are as different from each other as possible mm. so yeah kind of going back to the original question um the, do they just not differ enough to tell them apart species that ultimately is the problem. That That's where the, the kind of Brontosaurus thing came from, where everyone went, well, no, it's just a Padosaurus. And then people went back and looked at it again with way more skeletons and way more information and way more detail. And went, actually, no, this is pretty different. It probably should have its own name. We never talked about the Brontosaurus drama. No. We should we do an episode on that later? Um, probably. It means I'd have to reread that absolutely enormous paper. On it. <laughs> I think that would be a very good idea. So thank you very much, um, and Alfie to saying Chris. And I hope that answered the question. <laughs> now we've got Gildas, who's only eight years old, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, and Gildas not only sent us a list of the best dinosaurs in order, which was very, very good. I think Parasaurolophus should have come up further in that, though, Gildas. But he wants to know: Did Allosaurus have feathers? don't know is the short answer um the longer answer then becomes way more complicated as usual feathers get complicated quickly so for those who are not familiar with allosaurus it is a theropod yes so um big yeah. big carnivorous dinosaur big ones 10 meters or so long yeah. snout to that's, tail tip that's long deep you know good size animal one of the larger predators from the famous morrison formation in the Midwest of the US from the late Jurassic. So loads and loads of giant sauropods, Diplodocus, Patasaurus, famous things like Stegosaurus are running around, and Allosaurus is by far the most common predator um, and one of the biggest that's out there. So does it have feathers comes down to all the problems we talked about with feathers before about evolutionary relationships and evidence. So the simple thing is things that we have feathers for is basically the more derived is the correct term so the but the slightly later groups of dinosaurs so tyrannosaurs a group called consignathids and all the other things that people would be familiar with as being feathered they all pretty much definitively have feathers or at least we have representatives preserved with feathers on them so even if t-rex may have lost them or done something weird with its scales that i think it's fair at least in this context to call that a feathered part of the feathered group Allosaurus sits just outside that group. So, here are the here are three possibilities that would mean it could have feathers. First of all, feathers could have evolved just a little bit earlier than T-Rex, in which case it's quite possible they're floating around in that lineage. But we don't really know, we certainly haven't found anything like that. Second possibility, there was a paper out recently, uh, led by my friend and colleague Scott Hartman, basically suggesting that the physiology of some of the even earliest, and I mean back into the Triassic theropods, meant that they may well have needed some form of insulation to operate in the way that we think they're operating. The obvious conclusion is feathers go back that far, or at least potentially they do. So it's just to keep warm? Yeah, pretty much. Um, And that would at least imply the possibility that all theropods could have had feathers. Now we do have some theropods where we've got good evidence for scales preserving on them or certainly scale-like structures 
So it's not like that immediate means every single thing had feathers, but obviously if feathers go all the way back to the very start of theropods, it becomes a lot more plausible or possible that something like Allosaurus has. And then the final one is a thing called Conca Veneta. Ooh. And Conca Veneta turned up, again, I want to do that thing where I go, ooh, just a couple of years ago, and the more I think about it, I think it's probably 15. more like 10 or 12, yeah. <laughs> and Conca Veneta is a skeleton, so there's no soft tissue preservation. It has some odd bumps on its arms. Uh, on its ulna. Well, so here's, yeah, so as Izzy is already suggesting, famously Velociraptor and a whole bunch of other things, and indeed lots of modern birds have these little bumps on the ulna and various other bones on the arm. Those are called quill knobs, and that is where big feathers attach onto the arm. Suggestion was at the time, that Conca Veneta, these were quill knobs. Ergo had big feathers, ergo its close relatives could well have had them. I'm not sure that's ever been challenged in the scientific literature, right. but certainly various people have commented on that and gone, that's a bit weird. They don't look quite like normal quill knobs. They're not quite in the same pattern that we see quill knobs in. And it would be odd indeed, because quill knobs usually show up very close to birds. Mm. It'd be odd if quill knobs are all the way down here and then don't appear in tyrannosaurs and consognathids and a whole bunch of others. Yeah. And, you know, these things don't have really big feathers with a big defined shark. Because I think we have a different idea of what types of feathers there are, because quill knobs really does imply the sort of, I mean, I'm using air quotes, yeah. flight feathers that you're used yeah, to. Yeah, certainly, you know, big long things with a solid shaft. Yeah. And that's quite an advanced feather type. Because we, we were at the zoo yesterday and we were looking at the rear and the emu. Mm. And we were looking at the feathers that you get on them because um, they were coming off. And you, yeah. Yeah, he steals feathers from the floor at the zoo for his collection. He's a nerd. So the little, the fluffy feathers, the things that give the birds their shape, they're basically just fluff. They're just, you yeah, know, more or less. Or they're more like fur. Not much structure to them. Exactly. Yeah. So when we're thinking about, you know, could we say, for example, that if Allosaurus was feathered, it would have been fluffy rather than had like big wings. Well, so yeah, so that's that's kind of the big question over Conca Veneta is if these really are quill knobs, it implies a much more advanced feather type that we wouldn't see for many millions of years in a much, much later group, um, which is why people are rather suspicious of this, mm. in addition to the fact that they don't look quite right. So I think those probably aren't quill knobs on Conca Veneta. If it did have feathers, they're going to be relatively simple what feathers. What are they, then? Well, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, a weird bite marky type thing. Um, I, I, I can't remember off the top of my head. Um, there are a couple of write-ups on this online that people can hunt down relatively easily, I'm sure. But yeah, so it's possible that Allosaurus is close enough to feather dinosaurs that it had them. It's possible that Conca Veneta really had lots of weird feathers, in which case Allosaurus is more likely to. It's possible that feathers were around at the very origin of theropods and Allosaurus could have inherited them. But to my knowledge, we have no definitive skin of Allosaurus. Boo. So we don't know. Oh, so yeah. the, after that's, all that's that... The 18 minute answer is don't still know. don't know. Not 18 minutes, we're only on like, you know... 12 or so. Uh, so there we go. Um, so Edward, who is um, 37, but apparently thinks he's 21, would like to ask two questions. Well, let's see. Let's see if the first one's any good. Is there any evidence of dinosaurs living in burrows, given the number of avian dinosaurs that do? So we know that birds, like puffins, they live in burrows. Yep. Uh, other birds that live Burrowing in burrows. owls is a fairly obvious one. On Spring Watch this year, there were some um, shell ducks that were living in in somebody else's boat. Wow. It was living in an old um, fox den or something. Oh, that's nice. And with its chicks, it was very cute. And there were like three three females sharing a group of chicks who were coming out at different times. Oh, I liked it very much. I love the shell ducks. Yeah. Um, uh, so, so were there burrowing dinosaurs? So there's probably one. Um, it's, it's something that's a bit of an oddity that we haven't found more of them. I'm a bit surprised we haven't found either more burrowing dinosaurs or even other burrowing things like, you know, there were some largish mammals around during the time of the dinosaurs. Um, Erictodromius, so it's a small ornithischian. Um, it's said to have some digging adaptations. Um, certainly having looked at the skeleton and actually having spent quite a lot of time looking at digging animals, they're not particularly strong. They're not mm. built like anteaters or pangolins or armadillos or aardvarks or things in moles, things that are, you know, really good at digging big holes quickly. And anteaters in particular are very, very strong. Apparently you can't get hugged 
by a big anteater because it would rip you apart. Yeah, they're they're, they're quite they're quite. They're, but these things have enormously strong arms, and there's lots of very obvious specialisations in the joints and the hands and the claws and fingers to to do the kind of digging that they do. I'm imagining quite short bones with tendons that are very thick. And... So they, they tend to have very short, fat hand bones. They tend to have very thick fingers. They have um, this giant extension off the ulna, so the lower arm bone that points back. So they have this kind of giant, expanded, now, spiky sure... elbow. Hang on, hang on. Lower bones, that... are you sure they're not bats? I know they're alive animals, but if you've got an extension of bone like that, you could have skin that's attaching to it and then you could fly. That's no, it's, what... <laughs> it's, it's, basically, it's basically a big muscle lever. Yeah. But you also see things like they do weird things to their vertebrae to kind of lock them together. Because oh, cool. if you're trying to put loads of power into something very hard, you know, that energy will... Inverted commas kind of take the path of least resistance. So if your backbone is very flexible, your back will flex rather than the earth will break. Mm. So you want to lock everything up. So this is something you see in alvarosaurs, so the little yeah, anteating, yeah, yeah, or inverted commas, anteating dinosaurs. They have these extra little articulations to like lock their spine together. So that's a really good indication that they are doing this like power digging. And they have all the same things. Giant claw, fat hand, fat wrist bones, big extension of the ulna. You see some of that in Erectodromius, but nothing like the extent you see it in Alvarosaurs, let alone any of these other modern animals that I've just name-checked. And so, yeah, it's probably quite good at digging, but probably quite good at digging in the way that you know, things like foxes and badgers are, rather than, like, really burrowing, you know, proper burrowing, burrowing animals. I mean, do you think Alvar... Alvar... Alvar Alvarosaurs. I, I'm trying... I always, the trouble is, I always think Alvin, Calvin, Simon and Theodore gets into my head every time I hear it. You just it, said Calvin, like, Simon and Theodore, exactly, which is someone Alvin else again. Exactly, Simon. Exactly. <laughs> Alvin and Hobbes. What? Uh, <laughs> I get very muddled. Um, but um, Alvarosaurs... Oh, see. Alvarosaurs. Alvarosaurs. Alvarosaurs, right. Um, do they live in burrows as well do we think or no just... so so the thing with the alvarosaurs is their 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 arms are really really short mm. so of course that's very terrible for a very leggy chicken shaped animal to try and dig an actual burrow that it can get yeah. into it's good for breaking something open that's hard but it's not good for making a big hole i like to think of them as safe breakers so they're yeah. good to rob banks um Pretty much is that kind of thing. Yeah. So you you do and you do see this kind of split. So things like anteaters, um, for example, they have yeah they have this real strength and power to break open termite mounds, and that's different from things like moles, which are very good at shoveling and moving large volumes of soil. You've got things like aardvarks, which can kind of do both. Um, Armadillos. But at least some of those adaptations that I talked about, you you still see in both of them. And Erectodromius is just nothing like as extreme as these but it does have some of those features and the original skeletons were found in a burrow the bur burrow itself had oh, fossilized okay. so between those two features that's obviously really quite convincing but it's still odd i genuinely find it odd you know there are a lot as i say lots of things that burrow there are loads of mammals that burrow there are various lizards that burrow it's kind of odd that like one dinosaur stumbled on this or only a couple it does seem, I mean, maybe, is it something to do with the, because most, uh, when I think of a burrowing animal, I think of, like, why is it burrowing? And it's either because it needs shelter, but it's mainly to get at grubs and um, worms and that the sort tubers of Tubers and things like exactly. that. Exactly. Um, yeah, I don't I don't know enough about, well, I know, I know some about the biology of these various digging animals. Yeah, a lot of them are going after ants and termites and stuff like that, and they're not particularly around. But you see things like... Um, you know, badgers do it, and it's just a good form of general protection. It's it's a nice bit of environmental manipulation. You can stay warm or dry or cool, uh, depending on where you live. But badgers also eat things which are in that top layer of soil. And things, yeah, so. true. But I don't think they're they're, they're digging that stuff up. But that's mm. not the that's not the reason they're burrowing. No, that's true. So, um, but I'm, I'm wondering if one fed the other. So if there wasn't as much biodiversity, say, in the topsoil back then, or if there wasn't as yeah, many... Yeah, but I don't think there's any particular reason to think there wasn't. Uh, I mean, Erectodromius is, you know, it's not a particularly big ornithician. It's the mm -hmm. kind of thing that could definitely forage for that kind of stuff. It's an early ornithician. It 
evolutionarily, even though it's relatively late surviving, it's probably a generalist. That that sort of fits that pattern. Well, we were talking about previously things like protoceratops and ankylosaurs, the fact that they might be using their cheek spikes and that sort of thing to burrow through undergrowth and that sort of thing. Well, so I'm wondering if there were enough of them, then there would be no need to go digging yourself. You could just follow the bigger yeah. herds. Well, so, there, for example, sub-Saharan Africa... Um, the densities of some species are controlled by the densities of aardvarks because loads of things live in aardvark burrows. They're not digging the burrows themselves, but they're living in them. Mm. Um, so things like warthog density can be controlled by aardvark density, which wow. is therefore called, controlled by termite density, which is controlled by humidity. And you get this wonderful chain of <laughs> ultimately how humid the air is controls your warthog population. You know, again, the, the time involved, so to speak, in that, you know, dinosaurs were around for 150 plus million years on every single continent with thousands of species. It's a bit odd we found one and we've only just found it. Yeah. Um, I can't help think that they're, they're, they were probably more common, but I don't know why we're missing them. Um, Protoceratops has been suggested to be a burrower mm. because we found a whole bunch of them basically at 45 degrees under the soil. That's not usually how you find an animal. Um, weren't they living in like desert things? And yeah, so dunes? so I I think these are probably collapsed sand dunes uh, because Protoceratops shows absolutely no adaptations towards digging whatsoever, let alone for digging in loose sand. Exactly, and uh, also and also the fact that it got trapped there kind of suggests that it's not a good burrower. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. If you if you get getting buried underground, you need <laughs> yes, to exactly. Yes, yeah, so you need to work. Yeah, I don't think moles regularly die in <laughs> collapsed soil. No, because even if they get trapped, well. They can dig Mold. out. <laughs> <laughs> that's a that's a very good question, Ed. Which we do a second one. So, on as an archaeologist, yeah. uh, <laughs> uh, my question is: as an archaeologist, are you constantly asked about dinosaurs? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, the context of things found is often more revealing than the thing itself. How much research is done on the context rather than the fossils themselves? And this is true with human archaeology a lot. It's not so much the object; it's, it's where it was found. You know. The fact that you find, you know, a, you know, something in a pot which also has had um, fire something and cooking, and it, yeah. exactly. So, yeah, um, th that's very true. We we've talked about it a little bit on here um, for various things, but particularly the behavioural stuff that I'm interested in, mm. and so that's where that kind of becomes important. Yeah, if you're if you're just trying to work out the taxonomy, you know, is this species a new one or not? Who is it related to? How old is it? Um, that's kind of all basic stuff that, that the, the exact contents of the specimen is largely irrelevant. But when you're trying to interpret things like the environment, what that means for whether or not things migrate, and for all the stuff I've done about bite marks and feeding and things like this, that's really important. You know, I've talked about, I think we talked about my, the Sorolophus, so the hadrosaur specimen from Mongolia, I described with tyrannosaur bite marks on it. And we argued that this was um, not just post-mortem, but relatively late post-mortem. In other words, it was scavenging. Uh, and that being obviously a big question is, were they scavenging? And, and could you even prove it? And in this case, yeah, it was all about the context around it. Now, I didn't do that work because I'm not a taphonomist. I'm not good at studying this stuff. I'm, I'm not a geologist by background, and, and that's all relevant. But the team that found it and excavated had looked into the formation of the beds that it was in mm. and all the surrounding areas and went, look, this was found on a bend of a river. There's evidence for transport. So the bones had been moved, well, the, the skeleton as a whole had moved from its original place before it got buried. And then there was erosion on some of the bones. Um, One side where the fast flowing water is. Well, no, no, so, 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 you know, on, on the surface that didn't affect others, implying some had been buried and some hadn't at mm. this point. And so, all of that context, when you see the bites only on those exposed bones, that's why we think it's scavenging because we think the animal died somewhere else, moved, then got partially buried, then got bitten. And it's only if you have that order if you like of that story that you can say that with confidence i want you to think now everybody um in your ears about being a hungry t-rex and then working out how long that hadrosaur had to have been lying in this river before you went and had a little 
nibble. nibble. Because that's a long time. And we're talking fermented. Well, I don't think it's like I mean, it grizzly could, bears. It could have been days rather than weeks. But yeah, some animals. I mean, there's there's the video that I always love name checking where there's... You, you can you can Google it and find it on YouTube. There's a hyena basically living inside a dead giraffe. Wow. And it's, the hyena is just like matted black. You can see the pools of black goo that have just oozed out. And it's living inside the chest cavity. It's like, that is not fresh. <laughs> Lovely. Yeah. Right, uh, okay. So, next question. Are you ready? Okay. Uh, we have Joao, who... Love you, Joao. Joao Barbosa. One of the factors usually regarded as decisive in human evolution is to become bipedal. And it, that, has that freed the hands to use tools? Given that there are so many bipedal dinosaurs, is there a sign of tool use? That is not where I was expecting him to go with that. But that's a very good place to go. I mean, it makes sense because we've seen other, like, to be fair, there are dinosaurs that use tools because, you know, there's the story of the crow using stones to get the water level to rise. That's that's real. Well, you say that's, that's not... the Aesop's fable, but actually someone did that with, um, I think it was Cal New Caledonian crows, and they can do it. Wow. They can actually drop stones into a thing to raise the so, water yes, level. So, yes, dinosaurs definitely use tools, but <laughs> modern D dinosaurs. dinosaurs. <laughs> yes, did, did any of the others. Um, no, there's absolutely no evidence for it at all, unsurprisingly. So, as we say, you know, New Caledonian crows, they're, they're, they're often a kind of model organism for this. Mm. They're extremely intelligent. Scientists love setting them puzzles and they're really good at solving them. And they both use tools and make tools so you can give them things like wire and they will bend it to the shape that they need to. Amazing. This is really, really cool stuff, but that's never going to fossilise, uh, you know. Humans, I assume, would be making tools for tens, hundreds of thousands of years before they start making stone tools. You know, chim chimpanzees have anvils. They, they yeah. find stones that are good for cracking nuts and they'll carry them around. That's absolutely tool use, but it's a rock. Yeah. If we found that rock next to a chimpanzee, you'd really you'd, struggle to go, well, that's a tool. You'd be amazed, actually, because the way that some, some people, like, for example, in the British Museum, they've got percussion rocks, mm. which are literally, you can see they've been hit. It's like, oh, no, this is used for this purpose, which is so that you can call to that rock over there, which we found over a mile away, and it's a way of communicating yeah. over large di distances 8,000 years ago. So these are things that humans do. I mean, the main problem that we have is that the stone stuff is the stuff that survives. Yeah, quite. And so if they're using stones, I mean, you could argue that dinosaurs are using stones because they're swallowing them to help them digest stuff. It's not really tool use. It's not really tool use. But, you know, they're using their environment to help. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, it, it is that sort of thing we think of prehistoric man as stone age man but it's that's because that's what survived they yeah. were using everything else as well it's just that yeah you know you can make eroded. complicated things like bows and arrows and spears yeah all wood you can <laughs> you can weave stuff you can have yeah. you know fur and everything else well and, and you know and the big one is fire yeah and yet you know there's loads of fire in the cretaceous we we get the charcoal from it but whether it was used, there's not, yeah. there's no sort of like little cave with a little fire <laughs> with pit, a little and, pit and, yeah. with the like different like the bunch pterosaur, of velociraptors sat around the pterosaur around bones it, on skewers, on skewer. yeah, <laughs> and, and and that's ultimately the problem, you know, as it is with paleontology and archaeology as a whole, it's what evidence has survived and what do you know, you're, you know, goes back to questions we've had before, what do you know you're missing or suspect you're missing because of preservation? Also, there's this idea, I think that surprised me when we first started doing this podcast because I didn't realise that in the Triassic most of the dinosaurs were well a large portion of dinosaurs who later became four-legged started as bipedal yeah which is a really sort of weird yeah dinosaurs are ancestrally bi bipeds yeah which is just odd because you do what a sauropod because we think of as most animals yeah. as being quadrupedal yeah exactly yeah. and we're special but we're but, not but, but again it's 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 what happens with evolution and extinction events you know if we have a mass extinction tomorrow which massively disproportionately we're affects mass, mammals. We're having a massive. Well, yes, we are, but right. But if, 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 if we, right, we've had <laughs> a, a really you know, sudden one. <laughs> yes, you know, and and the main thing left over were birds. They're yeah. all bipeds. I yeah. mean, you know, eventually they'd probably produce something quadrupedal again, but it's going to take a good long while because everything's a biped. Yeah, we're not that special. It's quite sad. Um, in in that regard, yeah. Yeah. But but even even among mammals, you know. Kangaroos move bipedally. There's loads of kangaroo rats that move bipedally. Um, things like uh, pangolins walk around on their back legs. That's so cute. They're, it is. Um, they're like, they, they come pangolins. You've got to Google because they look like they're sort of coming to say, my liege. 
Yes, yeah, so they're, they're sort of slightly bowing towards. It's yeah. lovely. But you know, there's quite a few animals that you know, bears, of course. You know, there's quite mm. a few animals that are, at the bare minimum, very competent on their back legs, and certainly ducks. Can, can no, do they're very obviously. Well. Sorry, I was yes. thinking <laughs> runner ducks. Is <laughs> no, all ducks. Yeah, is he? Well again. done. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Penguins. No, they're still Penguins. birds. There we go. Yes. Um, do you know what's rubbish on their back legs? Seals. Yeah. They're they're they're, they're not they're not good at all. But um so. Um, the reason for being bipedal isn't so that you can use your hands, is basically it, what we're it, saying. It can free the hands up. I mean, that's probably what led to birds, is the, the arms aren't being used for something else. Um, mm. You know, that's that's going to help enormously. Um, but, yeah, it's... it's Obviously, it's not an obvious consequence of being bipedal, is no. the hands I mean, will be used for that. and the... the biggest evidence of that is T-Rex, who basically just sort of kept them to, <laughs> yeah. as decoration to keep their massive shoulders all strong, is the theory we're going with. So, uh, thank you, um, Joao. Uh, so, Stephen, here we go. Right, you're going to have to say that word. Tetanurans. 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 Please explain. It was a new word. I don't like change. So what what is a tetaneurin? Well, it's not really changed because certainly the name tetaneurin has been around a good long while now. Um, don't don't <laughs> age shame Stephen. <laughs> uh, I'm I'm novelty shaming rather than age shaming. Um, so as as with so many other things, it's it's a name for a clade, and okay. so tetaneurins is basically the clade of theropods, which is um, everything closer to birds than. The coelophysoids, so the very early Triassic, very spindly little theropods, and the ceratosaurs, which includes Izzy's favourite, the abelisaurus. Abelisaurus! So, yeah, it, it, it's effectively a term basically for most theropods. <laughs> um, and and that's that's all it is. But okay. obviously, uh, you know, as with all of these things, it's, it's effectively a useful shorthand. So, you know, the same way with tyrannosaurs. Everyone's familiar with tyrannosaurs, but what that actually... You know, for a scientist, it does mean something. It's that group, which are a sexual evolutionary group, and they have these features and they don't have these features. I and approve of things like this because hopefully they'll do it for ornithisians and stop calling them ornithisians. If you get more specific, you can just slowly erode the name. Well, there's neo ornithisians. Oh, <laughs> Unfortunately, there's. <laughs> Why call them ornithisians the at all? Yes. Because we didn't know at the time. That's... But you know now. Yeah. Yes, you don't but... want to call them and neo. We don't, and we don't want to go back and re edit. <laughs> 150 years of, of I w- I want scientific you to know nomenclature. That since you know lockdown's been easing a bit, I've been doing more comedy gigs, and I have been um, shouting at people about the ornithician stuff. And even people on a Friday night agree with me, at, uh, having a drink. So the answer, uh, Stephen, to your question is nerds. So uh, let's let a, let him ask another one. Um, Dave, having recently rewatched your um, Royal Institution. Is that is yep, it in the studio? Yeah, yeah, lecture. Yep. Um, lecture uh, in 2017. Is there anything you would now change about your views on tyrannosaurs? So, have your views on tyrannosaurs updated in the last four years or so? Not much, because that was it was a very general introduction to tyrannosaurs and T Rex, and as such, it's not like we've had some big fundamental shifts in mm. everything that we do. You know, there's there's lots of refinement going on. Don't think anything's changed it. The one bit which is a pain is there's been a couple of papers that have come out which have toned down the speed estimate of T-Rex. Oh. And the the um, the RI, because that's been a very popular lecture, edited my section just where I talked about how quick they are and released that as a separate video. Oh, and okay, you know, and it gets loads of comments going, oh, that's not true, doesn't he know anything about tyrannosaurs? Going, well... Given that I gave that talk in 2017 and the paper came out in 2019, it's a bit mean <laughs> to <laughs> criticise me for my lack of time travel or, or clairvoyant knowledge why about can't, future Why can't research. you just tell it immediately? Why does it take other scientists doing years of research for you yeah. not to get it immediately? And it, but if even even the original video, because it, it is very popular, it attracts comments now going, mm, that's not true, there was a paper last year, it's like, yeah, and it says the top 2017. <laughs> You'll you'll find that even when you're correct, people will correct but, you. Yeah. So you know. <laughs> so yeah, I wish I'd said T Rex was a bit slower, but it doesn't detract from the overall point so, I was making that it's basically a eff- very efficient long distance runner, and it's not really built for speed. Um, but yeah, it's uh, that's a really neat question, and 
you know, this this is common in paleontology. You know, we've done an awful lot of research on tyrannosaurs and T-Rex in particular. There's going to be some surprises because that's how it goes. But I'd, I'd be surprised if we had any big game changers. And even if there was something, you know, inverted commas, kind of like really big and new, I bet someone said it before it's been suggested. You, mm. you, you get this quite a lot. I think with the the mammals, I, I give this example to my to my students. Mm. If you look at older textbooks from like the, you know, nineteen eighties, nineteen nineties kind of time, so just before genetic data became like the you know the big thing, there was this kind of fairly well structured phylogeny of mammals that everyone thought was correct based on the physical anatomical evidence, and then all the big genetic data started coming through. And loads of groups got split up and moved around and Ooh. we got these new combinations and, and all the geneticists were like, oh, this is the greatest thing ever and you, you anatomists didn't know what you were doing and look at all these mistakes you've made. And actually, mostly what they reconstructed is something that people had been hawking around in the early 1900s and slowly drifted away from that as various bits of evidence changed it. But it's like actually mostly what the genetic data did was recapitulate an older result that other people had already had and suggested oh, okay. so it wasn't quite the revolution and that no one had ever spotted this and we'd never have got to this result without this data that that it appeared so it's quite interesting though that they changed it's almost too much information made them get it wrong, wrong. yeah because less information actually made it more accurate. yeah you, you you get this this slightly counterintuitive thing of called data atomization so if you if you over split something down mm. so imagine we're trying to sort stuff out by hair color or, mm. or at least or, or various bits of color on different bits of the body you go okay does it have a red head and does it have a blue body and does it have green legs or whatever like that but you could go well what about the top of the head and the back of the head and the side of the head and the bit mm. just behind the ears and then suddenly you've got 12 different data points yeah. and they're all red but now red counts 12 times on the head but blue on the body only counts once. once. And suddenly anything that has a red head gets clustered together because it gets 12 points, points to put them together and the blue body only counts one. And it is possible to do that. And then particularly if you can imagine with fossils, which are very important, not just for dinosaurs, but you know for mammals and birds and all kinds of other groups, we've eliminated huge amounts of data and you're trying to maximise what you pull out the skeleton. Yeah. Uh, and, and things can be linked together. It's, it's a problem called data mining, I believe, as well. Yeah, it's, it's, it's linked to that as well. But it's, it's, you know, going back to the digging stuff we talked about, you know, there are there are combined kind of evolutionary pressures. There's a lot going on genetically, but it could you could very easily end up lumping all the diggers together because they've all got fat, thick claws and all got thick fingers and all got reinforced wrists and all got the weird ulna. Mm. But you're just looking at actually one bit of evolution it has forced a whole bunch of independent changes, but it's produced the same thing repeatedly. And that's why convergence is such pain in the bum. Because <laughs> convergence does that to skeletons. Yeah. But it but you often doesn't to genetics. Just wait though, when it comes out that all T Rexes were slightly feathered with blue spots and were white, me and Emma Kennedy are gonna be yeah. laughing at everyone. So that is that will happen. We have a, a question here from Sarah Graham. Uh, she says, Hello from Virginia, USA. Hello. Dave's waving. Um, she is a grown woman and dinosaur nerds, and she has questions. So, um, she's always wondered if it is uh, if there is direct evidence of nostrils on the skull of a sauropod. Was it possible there was some sort of blowhole breathing opening lower down the neck to avoid some of the obvious issues of moving food and air down the same super long tube at the same time? Because that is just efficient when you think about it. You know, could yeah. they have had a blowhole like halfway down, like maybe at the back in the top of their, you know, spines? But you know, if you look at you know, like elephants, their blowhole isn't anywhere near their, you know, eyes and the rest of the. Well, mouth. but it still goes through the same. Yeah. Thing. So, so the first thing to correct is they're not moving food and air down the same passage. So, just like us and. Well, know. I don't think she was thinking, but it, it's close. Yeah, but they, yeah, they, they have a separate esophagus for food and a trachea for air they they definitely have nostrils so i think people tend to look at things like brachiosaurus that famous big crest on the nose and the yeah. huge hole in the side and you often see them particularly in older reconstruction with giant kind of openings on like the top of the head we now don't think that's the case 
I think that's just a big space and the nostrils are actually close down the front of the snout. Um, skulls like Diplodocus has a far more normal dinosaur or reptile skull and it's obviously got a pair of little holes at the front of the nose which are going to be the nostrils. They open into the airspace at the, you know, above the palate that pushes down in exactly the same way it does in basically every other air breathing animal. So I don't think there's any reason at all to think that they'd evolved something really weird like that. And also they, they've huge... got nostrils, they, they've got the yeah. same skull arrangement. It's also a huge advantage yeah. to being able to smell things you're about to eat. You know, yeah, that potentially. Is, and also be able to, you know, have that you know, smell capacity close to the brain is useful to be able to go, oh, you're, you know, I'm just going to see if you make a good mating partner. Sniff, sniff, sniff. Oh, yes, that'd be lovely. Thank you very much. Or, oh, no, no, you appear to be uh, something different and I should run away. You know, so this is, this is an important, this is you, how you, I you operate. You go back to your nightclub days. This is, this is me. <laughs> this is how I choose, choose a, a potential mate. I go, oh, sniff, sniff, sniff. You're good. Sniff, sniff, sniff. Oh, you're lovely, but you appear to be a dog. Well done. Uh, <laughs> So yes, uh, this is so, so, you know there is an advantage to it. There is a you know reason why our noses are near our mouths, and so we can taste stuff as well. Well, yeah, because yeah, your your smell is intrinsically linked to taste as well. So it's it all kind of tells you not to eat. Together. You know, do not eat poo. No says no. Yes. Um, so oh, she also has a um, follow up question. Dinosaurs like the Velociraptor, which she always sees mounted. Um, sort of reaching their claws in front of them would they have done this or would they have tucked down their arms close to their bodies most of the time so what i mean this thing when people you know do an articulated velociraptor they're always like ah zombie yeah. like reaching and clutching because that's exciting and it looks cool yeah, yeah I, mean, I mean that that's ultimately what it is yeah they the vast majority of the time they would have looked very like birds in the sense that the arms are folded up alongside the the animal and it's all tucked in and would probably look really quite neat and yeah smooth and like a stalk yeah um but yeah exactly in the same way that you know the vast majority of t-rex drawings online you'll see it running or at least walking at full speed with its head leaning forward and its mouth wide open and trying to bite something in half why because that looks cool and we want visitors to come to our museum and come back to our museum and excite some interest i so think there should be a lot of it. you know there should be and if you're out there paleo artists i want to see every single dinosaur trying to scratch its ear so i want a little back foot trying to come up or maybe just rubbing itself yeah against there's, something. there's not much like that i mean the, the big one is dinosaurs asleep there are you know Huge numbers of them spend a large part of their lives asleep. The number of illustrations like that, very small. Well, there was that um, lovely... Because it's, it's not dynamic and exciting for most people. But the way they sleep is particularly cool. So there was that dinosaur that was found with its head tucked under its We've wing. We've got a couple, yeah. Yeah, which is just a lovely thing. So when you're imagining a velociraptor going to bed, imagine its nose just in its armpit, just having a little... Yeah, it's ju- yeah. just like ducks. Is the, like, when, you, when you see ducks sleeping at the side of a pond... And the head's tucked back with the beak under the feathers. That's exactly what they're doing, but with the tail wrapped around them. It's so cute! I think, I think honestly, if, if anybody wants to make, like, little... You know, you could get, like... Obviously, you can get toy dinosaurs and stuff. But if you could get, like, little stones that you could carve for the little... Oh, hey. That'd be lovely little objects. That'd be so cute! Mm, squee! Anyway, thank you very much, Sarah Graham. Uh, we have a message here, and I think we've still got time for it, um, from Gareth. And it says, hello, Izzy and Dave. Hey, I got first mention. That is very cool. Uh, the museums in Berlin reopened a few days ago, and I was able to take, to take my overexcited four-year-old to the Natural History Museum. They had a special exhibition on parasites of course they did which included the skull of a t-rex called tristan otto that showed marks on the jaw due to illness perhaps you have talked about this before we have a little bit but what types of illnesses have been identified from giant dinosaur fossils has 3d printing changed the way the paleontologists can work if not why not thanks for the great podcast gareth so we have talked a bit about um pathologies and injuries on bone in fact we did it on our live session which which coincidentally was done yesterday, though of course that won't be where people listen to this. Yeah, there are all kinds of scars on bones and alterations to bones, um, texture and density and things like this, which are indicative of certain diseases or certain classes of diseases. Uh, There's a paper out just last year identifying a bone with cancer. Uh, In a dinosaur, there's stuff which has been suggested to be arthritis. There's all kinds of stuff of some nasty 
infection of indeterminate nature on injuries to various ones and you can see all kinds of the bone like decays and eats away or it all turns into nasty spiky stuff and sticks out and grows in odd little patterns and this is exactly what you see for things that have you know really nasty bacterial or fungal infections on, on wounds and stuff so the, that thing is absolutely out there though of course there's loads and loads and loads of others that don't you know affect your bones at all you know yeah. all kinds of tapeworms and blood flukes and not you know dinosaurs would have had all ticks. of these and ticks and lice yeah and none of them are going to leave traces on the bones no. um but yeah they're, they're absolutely out there what we need is a dinosaur feather in amber with a little there, there's, there on is it. one so th so there there is a there is a large flattened flea like thing from amber which was suggested to be a dinosaur or pterosaur parasite i if i remember correctly because obviously i do not keep up with the arachnological literature um it's now been suggested to to not be a, a some kind of flea ancestor but i think it's probably a matter of time now we're finding you know cretaceous feathers in amber we're going to find some kind of egg or some kind of small parasite on them. We, ju we just are. It's, it's only a matter of time till that stuff shows so, up. So, you know, even more um, reason why there should be loads of drawings of dinosaurs having a scratch. Yeah, and, and you know, and I, I've argued, and something I've always tried to do with paleontologists, uh, paleo artists I've worked with when I'm doing exhibitions or artwork and stuff, is I, I want them to be living animals in the sense that I want them to have little scars and scratches and splats of mud on them because... A few missing that, feathers that, and places. That's what they look yeah. like, uh, you know. Particularly in the... Like you said, we were at the zoo yesterday. And that emu had this enormous smear of mud up the side of its face, including going into its ear canal. Yeah. And it's like, this is an animal which has got... Lot, you know, it doesn't spend ages finding food, and it's not running away from predators, and it's it's got a relatively comfortable life, and it's still managed to do that and not clean it out. Uh, it's, it's it's boring. It's in there with its other emu friend and some donkeys. Yeah, so. <laughs> right. But it's but you know, but that's the point. You know, you, you look at almost any wild animal, and mm. yeah, they're gonna have some, you know, little scars from ticks, some fleas, or scratches from where they caught themselves on a branch or a missing tooth. And, is all very 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 normal is there any evidence because obviously what suggests that you know there are ticks and things need to get rid of that are there any adaptations like you know nibbling teeth to preen your feathers and that sort of stuff um so scansoriopterigids and, yeah. and the overaptorosaurs are the, the, the wider group some of them have these really procumbent teeth they stick out forwards to kind of meet together almost at like a, a, an angle that's not a million miles away from some grooming teeth that we see in uh, Demoptron, so the inverted commas flying lemurs that aren't lemurs. Um, <laughs> I know this is the problem with common names. That's hey. why I'm talking about Demoptrons, um, which are suggested to be a grooming adaptation. So it's possible that that tooth structure is there to help groom see, their feathers. I hope with Scansoriopterygids, if you don't know what we're talking about, there's some of these little bats type of dinosaurs yeah. with feathers. If you don't know what those well. are, listen to two episodes ago. Exactly, <laughs> but some people don't. They just drop in and out. They choose. I understand that. I'm a casual podcast person as well. But um, what I what I was wondering with them is that adaptation could have been, because they were so small and they could have been picking fleas and stuff off other dinosaurs, a bit like modern well, birds well, do. Possibly. So you've got I, a big sauropod going around with a load of mites on it, and you're a scansoropterygid, flap over to that, use your little claws to climb up the neck, have a little nibble. And yeah, I mean, pe people have been, people have done drawings. I think it's probably over-interpreted. You know, the, the classic example is the little plovers pulling leeches and stuff outside the jaws of crocodiles. Yeah. There's no actual evidence that they really do that. Oh. Um, but the other one, so something we saw yesterday... Um, the southern ground hornbill, so the big black bird with the red face. Uh, there is good evidence they pair up with warthogs. And there's of lovely course. photos of a warthog basically being groomed by this big bird. And yeah, the, the bird's getting a free meal oh. and pulling off the, the ticks and lice and the warthog remove, having its parasites from removed. This, from this podcast, I'm getting the understanding that warthogs are a bit of a freeloader, aren't they? Because they live in like our oh, burrows. Exactly. And they get the other birds to look after them. Exactly. They're, they're having, you know, maybe the but Lion really King was quite accurate. <laughs> I think I think the Lion King's depiction of, um, what was it? P P oh. Timon and Pumbaa. Oh, I love the fact that you know that so well. There we go. Um, I've seen the Lion King once year after it came out. <laughs> I yes, just have a great memory. Yeah. yeah. yeah um, <laughs> 
Lumumba. Uh, but yeah, but the fact that he's uh, depicted as a sort of casual freeloader is not uh, <laughs> too far from the truth, though Timon is far too relaxed. Yeah, anyway. For a meerkat, yeah. <laughs> for a meerkat. <laughs> uh, cool, so we've got one final question here, which is from Melissa. And she was wondering if we have any evidence that some dinosaurs might have been venomous. So and can I just congratulate Melissa? I'm not saying poisonous because that is the classic thing. It, it's also worth adding that that's a fairly new phenomenon. And if you go back 25 or 30 years, you know, there are books by academics called things like poisonous snakes because the two were virtually synonymous. But the now, yes, the, that, that, that is it. the separate. I think it's very useful separation yeah. and I'm happy to use it. But I would, but Melissa I would try not to pick people up on using it in its older version. Wow. Um, I know something, therefore I will pick it up. Yes. <laughs> um, so any, so there, there was one. So there was famously, uh, I want to say it was Synornithosaurus. I'm pretty sure it was. I always get mixed up between Synornithosaurus and Sinusoropteryx. I think it's Synornithosaurus. Small dromaeosaur from China. And a paper came out 10, 12 years ago. Um, a very short paper, I would note arguing that this was venomous and basically the argument was it had these very long teeth with grooves in them some kind of venom delivery like you see in a bunch of snakes and it had this odd little kind of cavity in the skull where a venom gland could sit potentially and i think it's fair to say this wasn't a popular interpretation <laughs> Um, the teeth aren't that long. They are obviously half falling out of the sockets. This is a very common phenomenon. We see it in loads and loads and loads of, of theropods. That groove in the side of the tooth is the groove that the next tooth grows into. That's virtually universal. We've, we've just done our history of dinosaurs. Gideon Mantell was writing about this in Iguanodon in like 1840. Yeah. Someone should probably have spotted that that's what the grooves in and those theropods are. Unless Iguanodon was also venomous. Yeah, and, <laughs> right, and, those, and those grooves don't reach to the tip of the tooth. Yeah. They don't go down the middle like you get in some snakes. They don't go down the back like you get in some snakes. They, they do not look like the venom delivery grooves that we see in mm -hmm. any other venomous reptile that does this. There is a weird cavity in the side of the skull. There is in almost all pneumatic skull small theropod they all have a bunch of little cavities like this why this one is special and the others aren't and why this one is specifically venom and venomous snakes and lizards don't usually have their venom glands there because these are usually modified salivary glands and you don't have modified salivary glands Up like in your nose. just yeah. yeah kind of halfway down your mouth you have you have you know in, in the th right right that's why if you see big venomous snakes they have a bulge at the back of the head i think we told this story about the guy who was milking mambas in South Africa? In I, Kenya, sorry. Um, did we? Milking mambas I can't in remember Kenya. who... Who, who you, tell you, you, you tell which this things... This is the thing. If you, if you have a volume of information trapped in your head and you're always talking, like Dave, he, he never remembers who, who, told who you told what. To. <laughs> so years ago when I was in Kenya, I met a guy called Gerald Ash who was a fairly well-known biologist and he was one of those very rare people who was cleaning large numbers of mambas to get the venom out to make anti-venom. Yes. And so that, that's where you have to pick them up and get them to like and, pierce and squid, them. Squidge them, yeah, basically. Yeah. Um, but, and yeah, yeah. He, he had these snakes. Now, admittedly, he was regularly milking them, which is stimulating the growth of their venom glands. But, you know, mambas have relatively big heads on mm. thin bodies, which is a fairly common, or a thin neck, which is a fairly common thing for venomous snakes. And their venom glands, correctly termed proglottid glands, were so big that you had the head and then a pair of bulges behind the wow. head that were bigger than the head for these giant overstimulated venom glands. Wow. A bit but like you they're get, not like... halfway down the face just behind the nostril. No. So basically the idea that Synonothosaurus was venomous, I don't think anyone basically agrees with it at all. But you do get, I mean, for example, um, things that we talked about, monitor lizards and things like that, which aren't venomous because they don't produce venom, but they do have bacterial... Well, so so that was the thing about, that was the thing argued about um, Komodo dragons is that they were they were venomous. No, it's just they have lots of nasty toxic bacteria that produce toxins. Now it looks like they do actually have some genuine nasty oh, toxins cool. in their saliva. Um, and that is very low level venom. They don't have any... Yeah, delivery adaptations, they don't have giant venom glands. 
and that kind of thing how would you know mm. i guess the what you could argue is we don't see that in crocodiles we don't see that in birds therefore we're probably not going to see it in dinosaurs on the flip side crocodiles are feeding very very differently birds are feeding very very differently you wouldn't necessarily expect either of them to have evolved or retained this kind of thing. Yeah. But also, other than snakes, which of course there are lots and lots of very highly venomous snakes, but they're a very specialist group in what they do and how they kill things because of the nature of the way they hunt, venom is pretty rare among tetrapods. Yeah. You know, there's two or three lizards that have it to any great degree. You got you got amphibians with it. Cause got, well, no, they, yeah. they, again, they that's, that's poison. That's yeah, that's to skin. stop things eating yeah. them. Because the thing the thing with venomous snakes basically is a lot of what they're eating and killing could do them a lot of damage, mm. or could escape quickly. Because they're it, bigger than them a lot of the time. Right, and they have claws and teeth and things, and snakes don't really have anything anything to hold something down or or, or defeat it. And uh, yeah, and it, or if they bite a little mouse and don't kill it, it. It's going to run off and they're never going to eat. I don't think you know this because I know you don't haven't done much research on snakes and that sort of thing. But do you know what evolved from the snake? Was it the constricting thing? And Constrictors then... are first. Okay, cool. Um, and venom evolved secondarily in a bunch of different groups. Okay. Um, but it it's definitely tied to the snake lifestyle um rather nice. than see i'm thinking now well maybe mosasaurs and things might have, yeah know, so, so but, this, but this is the thing if you know obviously it is a big whack of them but if you exclude snakes because they are doing something very specific and very mm. weird venom's really rare okay so my suspicion is yeah maybe you know maybe there's a couple of random small theropods that yeah like like komodo dragons and a couple of other things have some fairly low level venom which is quite useful but i there's no but no snaky, super toxic, nasty things out there. Nothing's going to spit at you. What do you think? No, not well, really. I mean, lots of birds spit, but they're not really. That's not really poison. That's more just you know. Yeah, I think one of them's fairly toxic, and you get things like um, there's some uh, lorises which have toxic saliva, and so they wash themselves with it, so they get oh, a little nice. kind of coating uh, for protection, but. Again, it's fairly low-level stuff. And these are, again, usually linked to very odd things. Lorises are very slow. <laughs> you know, that's fairly vulnerable Remind me what me. a loris looks like, so I can't um, picture it. So, uh, tailless lemur, so with, with rather long limbs, and they're okay. nocturnal. Okay. So it's little climbing primate with big eyes because they're nocturnal, and long legs, and they, they eat fruit and insects slow and baby loris. bird it's type stuff. Thickness. Yeah, yeah, the slow loris. Um so yeah, they're pretty vulnerable to a predator just grabbing yeah. them, um, and and hence that's probably what's triggered that. And mm. again, we, we you know we don't see lots of dinosaurs at least yet. Going back to the have we what dinosaurs haven't we found and what are we missing? Um, you know we we don't see a lot of those kinds of lifestyles which we probably associate with developing those kinds of features. Yeah. So my suspicion is there were few, if any, venomous dinosaurs, and if they were, they're you know, it's, as I say, it's fairly low rent stuff, and equally few of many poisonous dinosaurs for the same reason. Okay. Just run off. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Well, I think that's quite enough questions for this time. I think I just want to um, take a moment to really thank every single one of you patrons. That it's been amazing. We're we're very very overwhelmed <laughs> by your support. It matters so much to us, and it is. Um, brilliant obviously you can also support dave by buying his dinosaur book about tyrannosaurs just google dave heard tyrannosaurs there are links um also um for f following us on the social medias that sort of thing and oh if you want to support me i have a book coming out in september called um billy swift takes flight it's about spitfires it's not necessarily about dinosaurs but they're very not similar necessarily. they're very similar to pterosaurs there's same hens in it aren't there what oh. there, no there is there, there is a chick there is a dinosaur in it called susan she's a chicken she's very good but if you know any short people who enjoy reading historical fiction about the second world war um it's about um the women who flew spitfires um in the second world war which there were uh, so there we go it's called Billy Swift Takes Flights with Bloomsbury uh, go to izzy.com isdi.com uh, to find out more um, or go to davehone.co.uk is that right mm -hmm. yes you're looking at me just like yes you should know this 
remembering stuff. But obviously, terriblelizards.co.uk. And yeah, um, thanks to the patrons. We're continuing, you'll be pleased to know, for another series. <laughs> <laughs> when we plan it. Well, and, and we're doing stegosaurs at some point. Stop asking. <laughs> At some point, but we've got to keep we've got to keep you hungry for them. This is the thing. You've got to, you know, they say, oh, I want I want to talk about the plates. So yeah, so we'll be we'll be back. We think um, end of September, beginning of October, but probably beginning of October. I'm um, just looking at the diaries and stuff. But don't worry, we there are going to be extra um, episodes and uh, bonus content on our patrons. You can join our Patreon, which is patreoncom lizards and also I will put out a few little bits on this feed over the summer. Yes. Yes. Cool. Well, until then, in the same room we get to rat. Don't do too loudly because I don't want it to peak. So, three. No. <laughs> three, two, one. Rawr. Thank you for listening to the Terrible Lizards podcast, especially if you're a patron. Without you, we wouldn't have made this series. To be the first to hear bonus episodes and get extended interviews, please consider donating at patreon.com forward slash terrible lizards. You can find us on Twitter, Facebook and YouTube so you don't miss out on live broadcasts. All the links are available in the show notes or go to terriblelizards.co.uk. If you can't afford to support us financially, please do share this episode with your friends and leave us a review on your podcast app. Do say hello via social media or drop us an email, terriblelizardspod at gmail.com. We love hearing from you and we love to answer your dinosaur questions. 